Well, you've asked me to make you talk about what is an intervention. He's so rude. Hi, everyone. Hi everyone, welcome back and Gavin has persuaded me to do another video tonight which is why I'm wearing the same clothes as the last video. Gavin, what would you like me to talk about because I'm sure you have something exciting for today. So today we're going to talk about what is an intervention and when does it become an intervention. Okay, so there is a difference between an intervention and a provision. And it's sometimes where people get a little confused. So provisions are almost your reasonable adjustments. So you are providing something, mm -hmm. usually something physical. So if you have um, Erlen's, which is a little bit of a controversial thing for me to say, because some people don't believe Erlen's exists, and some people do, but it's just not in Gola. If you have Erlen's, the recommendation is coloured glasses or an, a coloured overlay. Okay. So a provision for you would be for me to give you your coloured overlay. I provide you with that thing. Yep. Okay. A provision might be that you need a writing wedge because you can't write on a flat surface and you need it at a slight angle. I provide you with a wedge to put on the desk so that mm -hmm. your paper is at the right angle. Or maybe you need a specific type of pen to uh, establish that proper tripod grip to be able to write properly. So if I am providing you with a different piece of equipment, that's a provision. Mm -hmm. An intervention is where I'm putting in a different type of teaching for you. So I am intervening, dipping in, and doing something different to either narrow a gap, remove a gap, fill a gap, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it, or to prevent a gap from developing. So if you um, are a student who doesn't read particularly well, I may well give you an intervention to develop your reading skills. And that might be uh, a peer reading. It might be sitting down with one to one with an adult. It could be putting you on a specific program like Lexia. Um, it really does depend on the individual. But that's what an intervention is. And that is how it is different to a provision. So when does something become an intervention? And the example I generally use is Accelerated Reader. And the reason for that is schools generally buy it and then they apply it to whole year groups at a time. Mm. And that's absolutely fine. So I'll use the secondary example. They'll buy Accelerated Reader in and they'll put the whole of year seven onto it, possibly the whole of year eight. Okay, that's not an intervention. It becomes an intervention if you then take a group of 15 year nines and you put them on it. So for them, it is an intervention because it is something additional to or different from, and it's the different from, mm -hmm. for that group of students. Okay, so when does the additional from come into place? What, 51% of the population of students? 62% or 69% of the students? Let's go for 69. Absolutely arbitrary. Um, so I, I would say to you if you know 69, 70% of your cohort is doing accelerated reader, that's not additional to and different from. It's not it's not a something special you're putting in place. Mm -hmm. Actually, the kids who are special are the other 30%. Yeah, so where is that number? It isn't, it isn't written in stone anywhere what that number is. You, it, I've kept using this phrase today, it's common sense. Once you're going beyond something that is additional to or different from for the majority of your school, that is when it becomes different. Okay. So in year seven and eight, accelerated reader is not an intervention as such, not in SEN terms. It is an intervention, don't get me wrong, it's a pupil premium intervention generally to narrow the gaps. To spend their pupil premium money. That's a bit cynical, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it is that, and you, you're trying to improve everybody's reading and you're hoping you're dragging everybody along with you. It's when it's then carried on into year nine, but only with a group of them. 
that's when it becomes an intervention oh. as opposed to a whole school method. Okay, so it has to be something that is different from what the rest of the cohort are doing, but also has to be bringing them up to the same level hmm. as what the the cohort is in the first place. Yeah. Because you wouldn't intervene, or, or can you intervene, to bring the people that are at the higher level to an even greater higher level and pull them away from the people at the bottom. There's a, that, that's got to be another intervention. Yeah, it has, but it comes under your gifted and talented or more able, most able. And that's not my field. I, I've always worked with the other end of the spectrum. Mm. Um, but yes, there is a, a theory out there that we shouldn't actually be stopping... You know, a child reaches the reading age for their chronological age, so let's say they're 12 years old, they've reached a reading age of 12, but actually they have a potential to have a reading age of 15. We shouldn't be capping them at that. It's, mm. It should be open to push them to get as far as they possibly can. Yeah, because we know that students, if they are just capped, they switch off, they get bored, and then they become the troublemakers because they're, they're too intelligent for the, the group. I looked upstairs, two of them upstairs. What, you mean the two year old? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I didn't mean the two year old, I was referring to two other children that mm. we have upstairs who, exactly as you said, they've kind of hit the level of where everybody else in their school is, which actually is below expectation anyway, but they are at that level and they're not being pushed to get higher, so they've mm. got bored. And they're not troublemakers, don't get us wrong, but they have switched off mm. and are not pushing themselves. And as parents, it's very hard to push because it's like, but mum, I'm doing everything teachers ask me to do and I, I'm already doing better than everybody else in my class. Mm. Why have I got to do more? Yeah, I'll just sit back and relax and let everybody else catch up with me. But that's just a bit of a waste of their time to be, to be going into school and doing that. Absolutely. How do you monitor... And review if the intervention is working. Pretty much the same way as you look at the targets. So we talked about smart targets in our last video. And uh, it's, it's pretty much the same kind of process. So you, you're going to put an intervention in place. It's going to be a smart intervention. So it's very specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and time bound. And you're going to go back to it after that period of time. You're going to check that measure of have they moved as far as our crystal ball had predicted they were going to move and if you're not sure on how you can measure provisions and interventions and whether they're working then you can pop along to our video about how I can measure the progress of an intervention within school so I suggest having a look at that one because that gives you some ideas around how you make those measurable scales um, if you don't have something like EduKeys Learning Plans and Provision Maps and I know I always cite that one I don't have Blue Hill software so I can't cite that and I don't have access to SIMS anymore so I can't do that one um, but you know we have got lots of programs out there you can use for doing that kind of thing or an Excel spreadsheet yes I do have those but I don't have one to hand mm. um, you can plot it all out on that if you haven't even got those though in the back of a project map it manager which is my second time today of showing this book um, there is actually a grid that talks about provisions and it asks you a series of questions around um, the measurement of that progress in there so what you need to look for how you can make decisions on whether it's working or not working um, not just it, it's, it's almost like evaluation of did this work why did this work why didn't it work all the rest of it and it, that's really important because it informs your future practice okay. is there anything out there that can help you monitor how interventions are doing Yes, there are um, things that can help you monitor your interventions. So first one is actually making sure your targets are specific in the first place. So you're putting that thing in place, you know when you're going to go back and measure it, you know what you're actually looking for. Okay, um, It's also that point of really deciding what your baseline assessment is going to be and how you're going to measure again at the end. So that might be repeating the same assessment again. So um, an example of that is I've just put a, a numeracy intervention into a school um, in a different capacity, but I'm doing a research project. But I've put the numeracy intervention into the school and I've gone in, first of all, and done the wrapped maths assessment with the students, 
gathered my data, put the intervention in for 12 weeks, and then I've gone back and repeated that assessment. So it's thinking ahead of what can I use, how am I going to do it? And it doesn't always have to be a commercial assessment. I prefer a psychometric assessment because I know that I'm using standardised scores. I can compare that particular child against other children who are the same age to see are they working within expected range. It doesn't have to be that. It could be as simple as 10 questions that you ask at the beginning of an intervention and 10 questions that you ask at the end of the intervention and has their score moved either up or down depending what you're trying to do. So of course with an anxiety scale you would want them to move down whereas with a confidence scale we want them to perhaps move up. So you're not always looking for an upward movement on scales but it's just really thinking about those kinds of things and having it clear in your head from the outset what exactly you are looking for and just as we said in the last video it's all about being smart. So specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, time bound. And that is your intervention. It has got to be those things for it to be effective and for it to be appropriate for your students. And at the beginning of this video, you asked me what's the difference between a provision and an intervention mm -hmm. effectively. So provisions, it is actually quite hard to make them smart. No, because they depend on what the child's needs were, surely. Yeah. It's a so reasonable adjustment for you, the child. Yeah, it's a reasonable adjustment. So giving you that coloured overlay or a different pen, yes, it's quite specific. It's very difficult for me to measure, though, the impact of yeah. it because of the very nature of it. I'm not achieving anything because I'm just giving it to you. Whether you actually use it, I might be able to measure that, I suppose. Is it realistic? Well, actually, yeah, it is, and it's actually quite important. It's actually a reasonable adjustment as opposed mm. to realistic. And is it time-bound? Well, strictly speaking, it's something you need, so I shouldn't be time-bounding it anyway. Yeah, there's no way that... Oh, unless there is a way that that provision could improve the abilities of that student when they're doing that type of activity. The way I would look at that is um, if I provide a child with a pencil grip, a very chunky pencil grip, I may look to time bound that for an improvement in their handwriting mm. over a period of time to then take it down to something that's not quite as chunky or to take it to a pen rather than a pencil. So there is an aspect to it, but I would say that a provision is very, very difficult to make smart. An intervention is easy. If you're ever questioning, this is an edgy key thing, but if you're ever questioning, do I need to review this? The answer is, if it's a provision, possibly not, because you can't measure something. If it's an intervention, yes. Yeah, unless it's a provision that you can change to something smaller that has or larger or, or larger that has a different impact on that, yeah. um, depending on what the outcome is of that. But I, I think I would probably argue, and you're going to have to edit and cut some of these bits out. Yeah. But um, I would probably argue that if I'm providing you with a pencil grip yeah. for the purposes of improving your handwriting, so giving you a really chunky pencil yeah. grip and I'm going to take it down to a smaller one. Actually, that's not necessarily a provision in that case. It's an intervention and the intervention is your handwriting. Yeah. I'm providing you with a handwriting program which starts off using equipment that yeah. is chunky and goes down to equipment okay, that is so less chunky. Okay, so that becomes chunky. part of the intervention rather than rather the provision. Rather than a provision. So you're, you're, you can provide things as part of the intervention. Okay. If you have any further questions on the subject, put the comments into the comments box in the section below. Okay, Abigail does, or has done in the past, answer them. But please, nothing super personal. We've had to remove one because it was far too... Um, Descriptive, I think, is the word that we have. Um, Give it a like, thumbs up. I can't do this. Remember to hit the subscribe button and leave a comment in the comments section below. It really helps with the algorithm on YouTube, which moves us up the scale and, of course, means we may hit that monetization and be able to put the money back into your schools. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>